Skullgirls, a passion project made by a small team. A game set in an unusual setting, with unique visual style, from a brand new developer studio among big competitors, where any game made not by Capcom would be forgotten after a few months. Despite all this, Skullgirls have found their place under the sun, attracted enough players and press attention, created a strong creative and loyal fanbase, and in the end became one of the most notable IPs in the genre. The game achieved these things not instantly, but due to its developers and community enormous efforts. Now let's meet the people behind this fighting game. Alex Ahad, creative director, a person behind Skullgirl's universe. He's responsible for unique visual style, character design, the appearance, personality and quirks. He also takes an active part in designing special moves. Before making his own game, he used to work at Gaia Interactive, Playdom and WayForward Technologies. A great artist who nurtured his game ideas about Monster Girls since college but the concept's realization was difficult until he met Mike Zymond. Mike Zymond, design director and main programmer, avid Blaze Blue and Marvel vs. Capcom 2 player, a well-known member of fighting game community. Since young age, he was interested in programming, began his career as a game tester at Pandemic Studios, where he worked on Star Wars Battlefront 2 and Lord of the Rings Conquest. Since 1999, he was making his own 3D engine called Z-Engine, which he wanted to use for his own fighting game. This particular engine, Mike's love for fighting games and acquaintance with Alex Ahead, led to the creation of Skullgirls. Together with Alex, Mike revised a lot of game components and finally, in 2010, joined the newly formed game developer studio Reverge Labs, whose publishers became Autumn Games and Konami. Mariel Cartwright is the lead animator at Lab Zero Games. She is responsible for remarkable character design and animation. Her ways of animating, coupled with her own distinctive style, greatly complement Alex Had's ideas, whom she knew before the development began. A hard-working person, took part in many projects, including Silent Hill games, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, and Shanty, Half Genie Hero. And by the way, she is Randy Cartwright's daughter, Disney animator, who worked on numerous animated films – Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Aladdin, to name a few. He is also one of the creators of CAPS, a specialized software used for digital animation. Peter Bartlow, CEO, designer and community manager, has been a part of video game industry for more than 20 years. Aside from game journalism, he used to work on several projects as a designer a man responsible for the foundation of Lab Zero Games, runs the show, communicates with people and promotes the game to the masses. Of course, these aren't the only people that work on the game. The bulk of the team includes Richard Sa, lead cleanup artist, Jonathan Kim, senior animator, Earl Gertwagen, designer, Brian Jun, cleanup assistant, associate art producer, Vincent Diamante, audio director, and Brady Hartle, UI designer. You'd probably think that with such talented people the game should do perfectly fine. However, not everything is as bright as it seems. Few people know what the developers had to go through to reach their goal. Since the very first day when the game appeared on consoles in 2012, misfortune fell upon reverse laps one after another. Skullgirls were getting a lot of attention. New character trailers, better gameplay videos, developers' monologues about different aspects of game development and animation were appearing constantly. Of course, back in 2011, the game was still in development, and some videos looked downright awful. However, with every new video, Skullgirls was getting better and better. It was playable before the launch at New York Comic Con, 
LA Anime Expo, SoCal Originals and EVO in 2011, where Mike Z also made a presentation, talking about gameplay nuances. Potential buyers were attracted by high-quality animation, unique lighting system. Um, so, one of the other things that we did that no 2D game has done so far is we actually have real-time lighting on all the sprites. So, like, if I jump in front of the window, I actually get lit by it. Um, every time I hit him or he hits me, there's actually a light in the air, so it's really easy. Rebounds gameplay, infinite combo prevention system, and also by returning to the roots of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 gameplay. In other words, the game was popular enough. It wasn't some unknown indie project anymore. Plenty of people waited impatiently for the release, but in September 2011, developers told that they have to delay the game until the first quarter of 2012. Peter Butlow told that extra time will be spent to polish the gameplay and add new features based on players' feedback, such as game speed up, new special effects, more complex 3D backgrounds, extra character palettes, macro buttons, gameplay rebalance, the list goes on. Without a doubt, the delay only made the game better. Finally, the game came out in April 2012 on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in North America and in May 2012 in Europe and Australia. First critic reviews were positive, everyone praised the visuals, good tutorials, nice music and simplicity. However, there were plenty of criticism. The absence of move list was mentioned by virtually everyone and was a big reason to lower the scores. Unfortunately, people didn't understand that the game was already in development for quite some time and the inclusion of a move list could take up to two weeks of valuable time. Move list is a part of an interface, which must be correctly displayed depending on character, console, localization, screen resolution and miscellaneous future additions. In short, Mike has decided to spend his efforts on aspects of the game more important than the list of moves, which you could either learn by yourself or look up on the internet. A PDF file made specifically for this reason could be downloaded from the official website. The developers promised to add the move list with the first patch, but the damage has already been done. Another shortcoming was a small character roster, 8 characters, during the initial release, which is a very small number, especially since Skullgirls takes its roots from Marvel vs. Capcom series, famous for having a lot of playable characters, 56 in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and gameplay, suited for 3 vs. 3 fights. On top of that, even though Infinite Prevention System got rid of infinite combos, it didn't quite work as intended. The system considered crouching normals, standing normals, and command normals as different types of attacks. Different specials were treated as different attacks too. Tagins, one frame links, and DHCs weren't working correctly either, so everything mentioned above led to long, monotonous and boring combos. And of course, how can we forget Alex's and Mariel's signature unique visual style that was branded sexist before the game was even out. It's true that there were so many panty shots, TNA and bear skin. Unfortunately, not everyone can appreciate the efforts of Alex and Mariel, who are responsible for such display of females in the game. Despite the fact that it is their trademark style, flashy sexuality was never the point of the visual style. Not a single one of the heroines uses her body in an ostensibly fan-service way, unlike some other fighting games. Just take my, Jury, Ivy, Share Me, Dead or Alive series. Developers specifically avoided such things. Peter Bartlow said in Eurogamer interview, Our characters are strong, powerful women who happen to be attractive. We don't have anyone like Kami, who wraps her legs around your head and then beats you senseless with her kegel muscles or whatever is going on in that Kami Super. There was a very conscious decision not to do things like that. None of the characters use their sexuality in any aggressive way. It's just a thing that they happen to be. Alex's views on his own visual style are as simple as they get. He just draws what he thinks is cool and interesting. Quote, Ultimately, the things you see in Skullgirls are there just because it happens to be the stuff that I wanted to do, he said. There are elements in the world that are just here because it's cool and was fun to make. Everything mentioned above is just small talk. Skullgirls found its audience and sold very well at first. For a niche game, to sell 50,000 copies in 10 days is a great result. Critics were happy, 
gamers were happy. What could possibly go wrong? Here, the tale about the Skullgirl's curse begins. After the game's release and promises of an upcoming update, came a period of suspicious silence. There wasn't any news from developers nor publishers. No DLC announcement, no patch, no info about expanding the game. That is, until in November 2012, right after the long-awaited patch, called Slightly Different Edition, was released on PS3, news came about that the whole Skullgirls development team was laid off because of the financial situation at Konami and Autumn Games. What happened? Well, let's start from the very beginning. Def Jam Rapstar A rhythm game made by 4mm Games, released in 2010, its audience being hip-hop enthusiasts. Karaoke type game, its main feature being able to record your own performance and upload it on a specialized website. At first it was supposed to be a small project for Nintendo Wii, but soon it grew into a full-fledged game for Xbox 360, Wii and PS3, with lots of licensed music tracks. What does Skullgirls and Karaoke have in common? The publishers, Konami and Autumn Games. Def Jam Rapstar turned out to be a costly ordeal for the developers. In Xbox360Achievements.org interview, Jamie King, 4mm Games CEO and one of the founders of Rockstar Games, told that the game collapsed under the weight of its own ambitions, hopes and incorrect evaluation of target audience. From exclusive Wii game with a budget of a couple of millions, it grew into a multi-platform giant, which required a separate website to function correctly, whose infrastructure, according to Jamie, was too complex for the developers and was ahead of its time. Besides, a lot of money went into advertisement and localization. Unfortunately, by 2010, the rhythm game market was filled with countless Guitar Hero lookalikes, so it was rightfully considered dead by many. And, considering that Def Jam Rapstar was aimed directly at hip-hop enthusiasts, no wonder it sold only about 500,000 copies. Out of nowhere, in 2012, EMI, British record company, sues 4mm Games and Terminal Reality Game Studios. The reason is that the developers couldn't secure the rights to use 54 music tracks in the game. Rap and hip-hop are genres that are based on using others' music samples and cooperation with multiple performers, which means a lot of paperwork when it comes to song's ownership. EMI demanded $150,000 for infringing every song out of 54, in addition to royalties. According to EMI, they have informed publishers and developers about their rights and royalties, but their words were ignored. Also, the possibility of another lawsuit was up in the air. EMI has the right not only to distribute, but also to perform the songs. Remember that Def Jam Rapstar is a karaoke game? I hope you understand the implications. What's curious is that EMI doesn't hold the right to songs as a whole, but only to certain parts of the songs. Additional questions come up when such label as Def Jam and such comedy as Universal Music Group, which are directly responsible for financing the game development and who own most of the music tracks, are having these kind of troubles. Not to mention, charges were put on developers, not publishers, who, by the way, couldn't do anything about the situation. What happened then? I can only tell you that 4mm games were closed the same year. But that's not the end. When it rains, it pours. News about another lawsuit appear, this time with Konami and Autumn Games as defendants. City National Bank brings the charges. The game's development was financed by a $14 million loan, which was supposed to be repaid with the money from game sales, because Konami estimated the game to sell 2.5 million copies over the first year. CNB accuses companies of lying about the financial state before and after the deal was signed, and that they didn't pay a single penny keeping the profits to themselves, and refusing to remit them to CNB. Additionally, the bank says that Autumn Games was supposed to get $1 million from Konami as an advance to pay down the loan, but instead spend it on other things. In the end, CNB demands $8.9 million as compensation for fraud, in addition to repaying the loan. As you can see, things are going south. The lawsuit drains the money from publishers, so Autumn Games stops financing her Verge Labs, Developers don't get paid a single coin from every copy of the game sold. All these events happened in March 2012. As you might remember, news about layoffs from Reverge Labs appeared in November. With this news, we found out that the team was fired back in July of the same year. Everyone who worked at the game left without a job and a salary. 
PC version was up in the air, and the work on the first DLC was temporarily stopped. It is worth mentioning that Reverge Labs wasn't closed, only Alex's and Mike's team was laid off. Official sources told that only a fraction of developers' team was laid off, but that was, in a way, a lie. The reason for the layoff was a bit strange, too. For example, here's what Richard Wyckoff, CEO and founder of Reverge Labs, said in XBLA Fans' interview. Can't say much except that Reverge completed the Skullgirls contract with Autumn Games when we shipped the game in April. And we aren't currently engaged by Autumn for any other Skullgirls work. Because of this, we did have to lay off some of the Skullgirls team. Of course, you can say that besides the main development team, there were plenty of freelancers and other people. But that doesn't change the facts. Everyone who was responsible for the game was fired. Probably there were only two people left at Reverge Labs, the same that founded it. Richard Wyckoff, CEO, and Emil Dechevsky, CTO. What can one possibly do in this dire situation? The answer was a surprise to everyone. Lab Zero Games, a new name for the old company. Peter Butlow, in XBLA Fans interview, shared some details. Lab Zero just kind of happened, he told XBLA Fans today via email. The team was going to launch one day, and was frustrated with the situation. And I just kind of blurted out, what if I made a new studio and we all went there? Much to my surprise and horror, people said, yes, do that. So I was kind of stuck. This way Mike and friends continued the work on the project, by founding their own company, where all fired members of Reverge Labs have returned. Autumn Games was still in the hold of the IP, and they gave New Studio the green light to work on the game, but they still couldn't fully pay for working on it. Autumn is paying for patchwork, but that is paid hourly, and only to the individuals actually working on it. We're pitching projects as a new entity, and have some solid leads, but as of now there isn't any work that is paying the entire team said Bartlow in one of the new GAF threads. The publisher was interested in releasing the patch as quick as possible, that's why they were happy to see the new developer studio. Skullgirls would not exist without Mike Zamet and Alex Ahead, something that Autumn understood from the beginning. Moving forward without them would be pretty much impossible, since only Mike understands a lot of the code, and what makes fighting games good, and the game style, story and the world are all Alex's. The developers were very interested in releasing the patch, because it's supposed to fix a lot of bugs, balance the game and address some of the players' complaints. We put so much into this patch as a way to show that we were listening, and address as many of the major problems we could in an effort to keep the sales going, convince fan sitters to give it a try, etc. We got some feedback from Sony directly that we incorporated, such as adding the new character tutorials. Unfortunately, this patch initially came out only for PS3. The game was released on Xbox 360 with the help of the service called Xbox Live Arcade, which has patch file size limit of 4 MB. The 600 MB patch had to be delayed. In the end, Xbox 360 patch with smaller file size came out in May 2013, after exhausting negotiations with Microsoft, when most of the buyers were tired of waiting and abandoned the game. New details surfaced about layoffs in June. Peter Butlow in the same NeoGAF thread said that the problem was purely financial. First of all, the separation between Reverge Labs and Lab Zero wasn't acrimonious in any way. They just didn't have the money to keep paying the team. And I believe they had every intention of hiring everyone back if the money did materialize. But when it didn't, we set out on our own. Also, approximate sales figures became known to the public. It wasn't a flop, but it wasn't a runaway success either. We estimate it sold around 90,000 copies so far. That's a good result for a digital-only indie game in a niche genre. Trying to get up on their feet, Lab Zero Games tried their luck with new different projects, but nothing really came out of it. Time went on, the team was running low on money, and somebody had to do something. By chance, in January, before EVO 2013, Breast Cancer Research Charity Drive has started. Donations were used not only for the sake of charity, but also to vote for a certain game. The one that gets the most donations will be featured at the 8th official EVO 2013 tournament game. In a few weeks, Skullgirls made $78,000, reaching second place. They were beaten only by Super Smash Bros. Melee, which raised $94,000. In total, $225,000 were raised, a very good sum of money. Despite Skullgirls coming up second, EVO organizers have provided dedicated setups for the side tournament, 
promised to stream top 8 matches and pledged $1000 as prize money. This charity drive gave hope to the developers. It showed that Skullgirls are popular enough that people are willing to play it and pay money for it. Finally, after the nation drive has ended in February, during a stream dedicated to the end of the charity drive, Mike Z revealed a new character, Squiggly, who's supposed to be the first DLC character, but wasn't finished because of layoffs. The crowd went wild. For those of you who are fans of this game and who are fans of other games and who donated all this money for breast cancer research, I almost said breast cancer again, <laughs> this is the surprise. And I guarantee you that no one in this room, including the people that are on the team, have seen this before. Wow. Squeezy! Oh my God! that. Yeah. So, ta-da! As you can tell... Oh, sorry. Mike also said that everyone who is interested in adding this character to the game should wait for news in the next couple of weeks. Anyway... So, for those of you who are interested uh, in her becoming more than this, uh, due, to the mad due to the massive outpouring of niceness to all the different games throughout this campaign, um, Stay tuned in the next couple of weeks. Sorry. Anyway, so there you have it. Something to know. Knowing that the publisher won't be able to solve the money problem, Lab Zero Games appealed directly to customers, fans, and fighting game enthusiasts. We were at lunch at Curry House, Peter Bartlow said in an interview. And people were like, we ought to try it, because, I don't know, why not? Indiegogo fundraising campaign was launched on February 25th, 2013, and immediately became successful. Squiggly was funded in 22 hours from the start, Big Band in two weeks. Developers were shocked. In the end, the team had more than $800,000 on their hands, which guaranteed the development of two characters that were supposed to be chosen by fan voting. An additional character, Robo Fortune as well as their story modes, arenas, four alternate character voice packs, and three announcer voice packs. The developers even managed to find time and money to add more stages, in addition to initial promises. Everything mentioned above was supposed to be free for a limited time. Nobody expected this kind of success. Indiegogo even made a special offer, extend the donation drive deadline in order to reach one million dollars which would be the record for this organization. But LabZero decided to refuse the offer, because firstly, that would be somewhat tactless, and secondly, the team wanted to deliver their promises, not make new ones. Of course, crowdfunding wasn't met with positivity by everyone. Despite the fact that developers were transparent about how and where the money will go, plenty of people were saying that $150,000 for just one character is way too much, that the team spends their money inefficiently, that they asked for the sum just to cover up months of inactivity. This line of thinking was heavily criticized by people directly working in the game industry, such as Seth Killian, former Capcom community manager, and Dave Lang, at that time CEO of Iron Galaxy Studios. Video game development is an expensive thing, most people can't even imagine how expensive it is, even when others are trying to be as transparent as possible when it comes to the financial side of things. More than that, developers purposely tried to save as much money as possible at the expense of their own salaries, just to lower the cost of DLC characters. Shortly after the start of the crowdfunding, in February 2013, Skullgirls came out in Japan. Sale figures have exceeded all expectations of the publisher, Cyberfront. The reports say that in two weeks, the game sold more copies in the land of the rising sun than the publisher expected to sell in the whole game's lifetime. 
Because of this reason, Love Zero Games localized the Indiegogo campaign for the Japanese audience. On January 30th, 2013, the news about the long-awaited PC port surfaced. Marvelous AQL was supposed to be the publisher. PC port wasn't going to be a hack job. The beta was scheduled to come out in June and have high resolution support, lobby system, in addition to early access to Squiggly. It seemed that just yesterday Skullgirls were doomed. Despite the uniqueness and warm welcome, circumstances and harsh reality of the game industry almost destroyed their talented team. While the game's future, patches, new characters, ports, sequel were put on hold. Despite all the misfortunes, our little team didn't give up and prove to everyone that it's important to never back down and to trust your fans. All is well that ends well, but this is far from the end. Voting for new characters was one of the main attraction factors of the crowdfunding campaign. 31 characters, two of which had to be chosen. Fans were making fun art, clouded each other's throats, and discussed the poll's results. Some people took the vote so seriously that they threatened to take their money back if their character didn't win. Because of such statements, PayPal, an online payment system used for the crowdfunding, asked Club Zero to provide guarantee and proof of their devoted involvement in the development process. On April 20, 2013, in the midst of the DLC voting, Peter Bartlow at NeoGAF reported that PayPal froze LabZero's account, which meant that they couldn't pay the team. One possible reason for the suspension was PayPal's fear for its own money. If someone's character didn't win the vote, a person can demand his money back and demand them not from LabZero or Indiegogo, but from credit card issuer. The person who donated the money can write a statement that declares that he has been deceived or didn't get what was promised. PayPal gathers the information about money transfer and works together with the bank to investigate the evidence and look into possible solutions. If consumers' demands are valid, PayPal is the one to pay the money back. If LabZero couldn't deliver their promises and release the characters, plenty of people could demand their money back, which meant a lot of trouble for PayPal. PayPal representatives, even outright said, until the threat of chargeback has passed, PayPal is effectively financing your development. Obviously, they wanted to make sure they are as safe as they can get. They also asked if we're good for $700,000 if something goes wrong. Peter Bartlow said no, because, well, <laughs> we're not. In the end, the restrictions were lifted from the account, although PayPal withheld $35,000 as collateral damage. That wasn't supposed to happen! Way back when Team Fortress 2 had promos could guarantee initial good sales for any game, Skullgirls developers decided to jump the bandwagon. Peter Bartlow in February 2013, during one of Indiegogo streams, said that the team wants to make Team Fortress 2 hats as promo material. Of course, responses to these news were good enough to prematurely include Leviathan hat as a reward for $30 donation. LabZero were confident that Valve's approval would be easy to acquire. Unfortunately, they were wrong. Several days later, LabZero were forced to remove the hat by Valve's request. The whole idea was now up in the air. Peter said that this was just a temporary bureaucratic setback. But in the end, Valve declined LabZero's request, explaining that they don't have the resources to edit in the game. Peter apologized to the fans, assured that this decision is not final promised digital goodies instead of the hat, and, if people demanded it, to return the money. Lots of people were disappointed, but there was still hope. On 11th of May in 2013, Peter Butler announced the beginning of the voting for new headgear for Team Fortress 2. Valve could add the hats, but only if enough people support the idea. There were plenty of hats to choose from, although the quality in general was mediocre. Unfortunately, people lost the interest and the vote was quietly forgotten. The work put on hats was not in vain though, officially the hats were not released. 
but anyone can wear them in game with the help of Steam Workshop. Take the shot, Juju. Juju. New players unfamiliar with Indiegogo events might not even know who she is. Back in the day, her fate angered the whole community and once again expressed the human stupidity and ignorance in this whole glory. Everything began way back in 2011 with a seemingly innocent Facebook post. One guy by the name Sim McNeil proposed an idea for a character who would be a Chinese sniper with a talking rifle. Alex had liked the idea and drew a sketch of this character during Whiteboard Wednesday, a small event while UpZero team drew various things on Whiteboard. Juju became one of the Black Eagret members and served under Parasol's command. It was implied that she's the one shooting during Parasol's style and scope blockbuster. Alex had even added to the game a chance for Parasol to mention her by name. It should be noted that C's only investment in the character creation was a single Facebook message. One and a half years later, the Indiegogo drive begins, where two characters had to be chosen by vote. Out of the blue, Juju becomes one of the characters featured in the voting. C suddenly remembers about Juju and writes a Facebook post where he says that it would be nice to get some reward because he took part in her creation. It's unknown whether he was serious or not, but LabZero decided that it would be better to engage in the conversation with C than to completely abandon the character or to take the case to the court because of one post. The licensing of character rights is a lengthy and costly process, so Juju had to be excluded from the first DLC votes, and later from the second one. Finally, all the formalities were handled, and the character rights were quiet, but C was legally obliged to keep quiet about this fact until the official announcement. The very next day, C broke the non-disclosure agreement with the post on Skullhard forums and made his contract with Lab Zero void. Further cooperation had to be stopped, and Juju, as a part of Skullgirl's universe, was abandoned. Lots of time, nerve and money were wasted and invalidated with one single post, which, to be frank, was to be expected. C has always pissed everyone off with his forum posts and RC messages. Nobody expected anything good from C, but you know what they say, a fool is worse than an enemy. Wait for the Encore! Just wait for the Encore. The prophetic words from the first gameplay trailer. Some people never even wonder how Skullgirls got the Encore part. There's no remastered version or patch with a price on top behind it. As you may remember, besides Autumn Games, Konami was also a Skullgirls publisher. To be fair, the involvement was needed purely because of Microsoft's policy, since in order to get released on Xbox Live Arcade, you need a retail publisher's support. Other than that, they did more harm than good. Towards the end of 2013, the team understood that further cooperation only hindered the release of updates, because Konami refused to greenlead any patch or DLC until App Zero tested the content inside and out and covered the expenses from their own pocket. Besides that, Konami refused to help the team with the Microsoft certification process. This led to termination of the business relationship between Autumn Games and Konami in November 2013. Now, despite the fact that patch was almost ready, a lot of paperwork laid ahead, because without the new publisher, update releases were unthinkable. Due to the difference between services, Autumn Games was the publisher for PSN and Marvel's AQL was responsible for Xbox Live. Without them, the game would be removed from the stores completely. Of course, this meant that Xbox 360 patch was going to be delayed again. Since Konami was the publisher in the US and Europe, the Japanese version and PC version were about to be released without any hindrances. Unfortunately, Konami couldn't just leave without pulling a dirty trick. On 6th of December 2013, during weekly Salty Cupcake stream, Mike brings bad news. Because of the relationship disillusion, Konami demanded from Sony and Microsoft to remove Skullgirls from PS Store on 17th of December and 31st of December from Xbox Live. Club Zero found out about this only after Sony informed them about the fact, which meant that the decision was already approved on Sony's side. 
Mike had to work in haste on a new version of the game, which was supposed to replace the old one. The reason for that is every game has an ID number and communications ID, so if Konami wanted to get rid of the game, they fully had the right to do so. Simply put, nobody could buy the game until the new publisher appeared. Other than that, there were plenty of issues to solve. Getting a new IP address for Autumn Games, transferring the consumer purchases to the new version of the game, making a new publisher deal with Sony's different regional divisions and Autumn Games, creating trophies and leaderboard from scratch for Sony, since Skullgirls would be treated as a new game at PSN, sending the new build for testing after dealing with aforementioned problems. Time was short. What's more, the team asked Konami to give them time till 31st of December to fix the problem with PSN, but Konami told that Sony won't let them. Then Sony asked Konami to extend the deadline, but Konami said that Autumn won't let them. Finally, when Sony, LabZero and Autumn Games asked together to move the deadline, Konami just didn't say anything. And that's that. Sometime later, they agreed to give extra time, leaving a strong sense of displeasure. Theoretically, there was enough time to update the game for PSN and to finish the paperwork before the new year if everything would go smoothly. Still, the Xbox 360 patch could only be released after publisher change, so until 31st of December this would not be possible. In the end, Skullgirls disappeared from stores on 31st of December. At the Indiegogo campaign page, Peter Bartlow explained what is going to happen with the game in the near future. New version for PSN is planned to be released in January. The Xbox Live update is going to be released with a delay again, because Marvel's AQL can send patches to Microsoft for testing purposes only after the end of holidays. Additionally, the process is going to be delayed because of bureaucratic work associated with publisher change and signing of the new contracts. The new versions will get a new name, Skullgirls Encore. Finally, Skullgirls was released on PSN in the US on 11th of February in 2014, 19th of March in Europe and 15th of July in Japan. Xbox 360 owners had to wait until 22nd of April 2014. As mentioned before, the PC version was saved from these perturbations. It should be mentioned that Cyberfront, Japanese Skullgirls publisher, was dissolved by a parent company, Kaga Electronics, on 19th of September in 2013. Fate of the Japanese version was also hanging up in the air. This news got everyone by surprise. Attempts to contract Cyberfront representatives were futile, and to be fair, there's no information up until 2015 about what was happening to Skullgirls' Japanese publisher. As far as I know, the old version wasn't removed from the store, but Skullgirls Encore appeared on Japanese PSN on 15th of July in 2014 under the publisher Marvelous AQL. What's curious is that the Xbox version came out a month earlier in Japan. In general, Skullgirls got cut off free, forcing Fate to work on themselves. Publisher Switch only did good for the game, allowing the team to work on further updates in peace and quiet. That doesn't mean that the curse was over. In May 2014, news came out. The team is forced to change colors on Valentine's crosses and several other characters. Why? The answer is the Red Cross, an international charity organization. The Red Cross emblem is copyrighted by Geneva Conventions, and in the past couple of decades, the Red Cross was trying to protect their logo from use in violent movies and video games. Valentine has this logo as a part of her design, she's a nurse after all. Despite the fact that Red Cross never complained about it, it happens that over in Japan they take Red Cross shenanigans very seriously. So during the initial Skullgirls release, Cyberfront had to sign a document which said that they will take full responsibility if Red Cross tries to take the issue to the court. After Cyberfront's dissolvement, Marvelous AQL took over publishing in Japan. In their turn, they decided to not sign such documents, since they didn't want to get involved. Autumn Games, in case of a possible lawsuit, tried to put the responsibility on themselves, but Marvelous refused to willingly violate the law, even if another company is willing to take a hit. In the end, the color of crosses was changed from red to magenta by a request from Marvelous. It's no secret that console game development deals with limited resources and requires certain sacrifices. 
Sometimes you have to use low-quality textures and models, use engine tricks and cut content. There are plenty of ways to acquire needed results. Skullgirls went through all this during the development too. For example, Peacock and Double Blockbusters, Peacock Intro and iBeam Special were cut before the release. Assists, until certain time, didn't play win animations if they were on stage when the opponent was defeated. On consoles, you could often see character sprites disappear completely during character tag-ins or during intense matches, leaving only visible hitboxes in their place. In further patches, the game was optimized, lengthy load times were sped up and visible hitboxes were changed to low-resolution sprites during memory shortages. Big Band also introduced a lot of issues in the development process. His size was shortened while he was still in beta, and Take a Train Special, for a short time, was unavailable as an assist attack because the animation took way too much memory. Eliza, according to the prototype, was supposed to spill blood all over the stage to use it later in different ways. Some fans think that this time of gameplay couldn't make it because of performance issues, though more likely is that the team decided to take a different route with the character. After all, a prototype is just a concept, not a final design. Despite console limitations, Mike, as time went on, optimized the engine, managed to deal with most problems and even add new special effects, such as improved dynamic sprite lightning. The curse follows schoolgirls wherever they go. EVO 2014, the most important FGC event of the year. Even though schoolgirls didn't make it to the main lineup, place and time for their own tournament is guaranteed by Mad Cats. Lab Zero and Autumn Games pledge $500,000 as a pot bonus, which will be shared among top 16 players. They also had their own stream time. From 11 am to 13 pm, Tekken was supposed to be streamed. Then, from 13 pm to 15 pm, Skullgirls. Everyone was waiting impatiently for the tournament, and of course, for the stream. But when the match awaited time came, you were so taken, and the matches weren't even close to the end. What's worse, those were exhibition matches, first to 13. There are two reasons why this happened. Firstly, Tekken players came out an hour late, and secondly, Markman, Madcat's community manager, was occupied with business meetings and couldn't supervise the whole deal. Skullgirls fans judged the situation as a spit in the face of the whole community. Even when Tekken players ended their matches, one hour of stream time was spent on new character announcements for Mortal Kombat X. To summarize, the stream of the biggest Skullgirls tournament was delayed for three hours and only included the last hour of the tournament, semi-finals. During the stream, Markman apologized to the public and tried to redeem himself with free t-shirts and caps, which angered plenty of viewers. In the end, out of the planned top 16, only top 4 were shown on stream. It should be noted that those matches were fantastic with skillful play from the participants. Markman apologized after the following events and explained the situation on NeoGAF, promising to pay more attention to Skullgirls and to promote the game as hard as he can. In 2015, Skullgirls had another unlucky stream, this time at Combo Breaker 2015, the biggest Skullgirls tournament of that year. More than 100 participants, $2000 pot bonus. Unfortunately, every single stream goes down because of technical difficulties with internet service providers. Everyone has to watch the tourney recordings on YouTube. In April 2015, one of the beta patches changed a couple of animation frames for Cerbella, Philia and Fuquo. According to the developers, these frames were on their to-do list for a very long time since they didn't correspond to their own Panzershot motto. Quote, well, they're sexy girls and they're fighting. If one of them is wearing a skirt, you're bound to see some panty. We're not trying to hide it, but we're also not going out of our way to show it either. Of course, the masses took this change for censorship and blew everything out of proportion. The thing is, the outcry began almost half a year later by the word of mouth after the patch release on consoles. Most people didn't even know about altered frames until they were told about them. Earl Gerthwagen explained the situation in depth at Reddit, bringing clarity to Lab Zero actions. This isn't the first time game was altered in this way though. Before the release, two filial wind poses were removed. Soon after the vanilla release, Parasol was left without one of her panzer shots. Eliza DLC was made with very warm responses. 
You bet, she was the first of two characters that won the vote, with outstanding story mode and three new stages, one of which was very different from the rest, Gehenna. Dark, unpleasant, but very atmospheric stage with eerie music was hard to stomach for some people. By request, the stage was removed from random stage select with wolf patch update. Initially, people thought that the stage is either too scary for some, or that colorblinded have a hard time playing on it, because of its specific lighting. As Earl Gerfagen said, the reason for the removal are complaints from people with disembodied ice phobia, and there are plenty of ice at this stage. In summer of 2014, Peter Butlow brings in the news. Skullgirls about to be released for PS4 and PS Vita the same year. Unfortunately, difficulties with Vita ports and waiting for the Beowulf and Robo Fortune development forced the release date to be delayed until 2015. The team promised cross-platform play for PS3, PS4 and PS Vita, fully voiced story mode, combo tutorials, trials and survival game modes, all arcade stick support that used to work for PS3. And by buying the PS4 version, the customer would also get the Vita version for free, and vice versa. Additionally, Skullgirls changes its name once again in order to distinguish the old version from the new one, Skullgirls Second Encore. Quite a treat, this new release. Second Encore comes out on 7th of July in 2015 for PS4. Other platforms are left with a simple patch and a new character, RoboFortune. The reason why they didn't release the updated version with additional content simultaneously for our platforms are next. Porting new features costs money, and time exclusivity common for most multi-platform games. What's curious, Bathlow at Skullhard Forums told that Sony barely financed the port and the development of the new version. Most of the money comes from Atom Games, which is a bit strange. In the end, the PS3 didn't get additional features at all, while the PC got its version only on 13th of April in 2016. The PS Vita version, despite its promises, comes out on 5th of April in 2016. The reasons for the delay are new bugs, additional features for upcoming Japan release, weak Vita hardware, and optimization, which was one of the main hurdles for the developers. At least Vita got the game, Xbox One was left without one for a long time because of Microsoft piracy policy. Either games come out on all platforms simultaneously, or they don't get released at all. Skullgirls became available on 21st of January 2016, when they were added to the list of backwards compatible games. About the Japanese second Encore release. In August, Arc System Works announced that they will publish Skullgirls in Japan. The game will get the long awaited dub in Japanese. Additionally, Skull Hard Box is going to be released, the collector's edition of the Skullgirls Second Encore, which includes the game, the soundtrack, and art book with 32 pages. It's mind blowing that Western games get so much attention from Eastern publishers, but there's always a fly in the ointment. Arxis has a bad reputation of jealousy towards YouTube and videos that show gameplay with Japanese voices and story mode. A few channels got strikes and had to delete all the videos containing aforementioned stuff. This isn't the first time Axis does this. Just remember Uniel's frame data and Blaze Blue release. Even the second encore release on Steam didn't live unscathed. The update release on 13th of April in 2016 was accompanied by a 33% discount for everybody and 50% discount for those who had all DLCs on their account. For some internal reasons, a lot of people who supported Indiegogo Drive back in the day were left without a special discount, so everyone who had trouble with this had to post about it in a specific thread and give information about the Indiegogo participation. The problem was solved on 26th of April, two days before the special offer ended. Historically, all updates and DLCs for Xbox 360 came out with various delays. The first patch for Xbox 360 came out half a year after its release on PS3. Squiggly initially was available only for PC and PS3. For Xbox 360, she was released together with Big Band in April 2014. This update was a bit buggy. Squiggly and Big Band for Xbox 360 could be selected only by pressing the light punch button. To solve this issue, it was recommended to delete all updates and reinstall new compatibility pack DLC, or to wait for color pack DLC, which was supposed to fix this bug. For some European PSN regions, Skullgirls Anko update was unavailable. Squiggy was unavailable too, unlike Big Band. 
the PC version was free from these issues. Same year, in May, Pukuo came out, this time without any delays. Eliza's release was about to arrive in time, sometime in the end of September or the beginning of October, but as you might have guessed, nothing is certain with Skullgirls. The Xbox 360 patch appears at Xbox Live accidentally, and then disappears just as quickly. Peter Butlow said that to release a new character for Xbox 360, three separate updates are required – title update, compatibility patch, and the DLC itself. Because of bureaucratic mix-ups, Eliza's DLC was released immediately after the certification process, even though other updates weren't certified yet. LabZero asked Microsoft to remove the DLC in order to avoid further problems and to not confuse the customers. Then the news came from Microsoft. Compatibility pack and title update can't make it through the certification because of two-year-old bug, which existed without any issues all this time. Soon the bug was fixed, and DLC was finally released on 14th of October in 2014. The next patch with Beowulf was released in April and May of 2015 for different regions. RoboFortune patch was released for PS3 on 7th of July 2015, for Xbox 360 on 31st of July 2015. The lobby patch came out in January and February of 2017. This patch added a long-awaited lobby system for PS3, PS4 and Vita, which was promised since the game's release. The last patch was released in spring of 2017, which marked the supposed end of major updates for the game. The game for a very long time was available only in digital. The only exception was the Japanese Collector's Edition. Everything changed in October 2016, when Limited Run Games, a company that specializes in releasing custom physical editions for digital-only games, announced that Skullgirls is getting a physical release. It includes either a PS4 or PS Vita version, game manual, and a special edition of the soundtrack. A PS4 plus PS Vita bundle was also an option. As a bonus, if the number of pre-orders reaches 10,000, the Japanese voiceover will be added for free to all available platforms. Despite the offering being limited only for two weeks, the pre-orders reached the desired number in time. It seems all that's left is to design the aesthetics for the box, the manual and to compile the soundtrack, and the product is ready for shipping, but nothing as easy as it seems. Initially, the release of the collector's edition was planned in January 2017, but at the time it was clear that additional preparations were unavoidable. According to Skullgirl's blog, there were plenty of issues. Japanese voiceovers required a lot of paperwork, which is understandable. Using actor's voice overseas requires a lot of time, money and new agreements. Another big hurdle was cooperation with Sony and its policy towards physical editions of the game. Not only build process was different from the norm, because of the remaster status of the physical edition. What's more, the remaster itself could get through QA testing only after the final patch was thoroughly tested. The PS Vita version was only making things worse. Vita doesn't support remastered software, which meant that the game had to be treated as a separate entity. And don't forget that every single version has to support cross-platform multiplayer between three different consoles. A very difficult task. In February, news about the delay surfaced. Getting the rights to the Japanese dub turned out harder than expected. Approximate process of licensing the voices looks something like this. Drafting a contract. Approving it. Translating into Japanese. Having that approved. Then physically mailing it to Japan to have it signed. Then physically mailing it back. That's the 31st century for you. And don't forget about the release of the lobby patch, which brings new bugs. New estimated time – about 4 weeks. Oh, how naive. In May, developers talked about new issues. Additional testing was required by the international publisher. Physical Edition is the final version of the game, and is supposed to be perfect in terms of stability and compatibility with different versions, especially considering the addition of the lobby system and cross-platform multiplayer. July. Another delay this time because of few discovered bugs that had to be fixed in all console versions of the game. PS Vita is slowing down the whole deal, as usual. It's been about half a year, so dissatisfied clients become more and more vocal. In addition to the apologies, LabZero decides to add to every copy of the game a pencil board for free. It's a small thing, but it matters. The same month came good news. 
The PS4 version was approved by Sony, which means that physical copies are now ready for production. The final release date is scheduled sometime in autumn, but because of undetermined status of PS Vita version, nothing is concrete. Finally, on 6th of October 2017, Limited Run Games announced that they are about to finish their production of the physical edition for the PS4. Shipping began in the middle of the same month, but because the PS Vita version was still in development, every order that included it was delayed until the testing process was over. Four months later, on 15th of February 2018, Limited Run Games tweeted that the Vita release of Skullgirls 2nd and Core will finally be shipped at the end of the month. Next month, people finally got the Vita version. It was a long wait, but it was certainly worth it. The past, long years full of troubles and hardships. The present, united fan groups, universal recognition, and lots of experience under the team's belt. The future, countless possibilities. All this would not be possible without strong united community, without Mike Z's genius, without Alex's and Mariel's talent, without Peter's persistence, without workaholics from Lab Zero, without patient publishers, without devoted fans of the game. This product of massive labor and immense love makes genre enthusiasts hearts race. I hope that your heart is not going to remain indifferent. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.